Good morning. Life is not fair. There is a lot of evil going on in this world, and it seems more and more often they'd face no consequence for it. We can think of any number of examples. Just read the news. Look at uh, all these um, politicians who are day trading and using all of their information as insider information in order to get rich, exploiting us. Look at uh, all these corporate executives that are raising prices during inflation to maximize their profits all the time we're paying for it. This world is not fair. There are wicked people within this world that are taking advantage of us every single day. And what can we do about it? There's nothing we can do. It's unfair. We try to be good. You know, as Christians, we're doing what is good, but it seems like we're suffering for it. Um, we refuse to steal, but that just means we're paying full price before other people are taking. Uh, we refuse to bribe. We are, we're not bribing people, but that just means we have to keep the laws other people are breaking. Uh, we don't lie. We're not liars. So that just means we have to do things honestly while other people cut quarters. It seems like constantly we're coming up short. <laughs> but this line of reasoning, this way of thinking is a huge problem. This is not the way we should be thinking. Um, this morning we're going to look at Psalm uh, 73. Psalm 73. And what we'll find is Asaph, uh, one the author of this psalm, one of the prophets, is going through the same line of line of thinking. He sees the wickedness of the world, and he thinks to himself, why is it? Why do the wicked prosper while the good suffer? Um, and he, he looks at this thing, and he, he recognizes it is properly unfair. He understands that it's not fair that this is happening. And he goes through this, this giant arc, this sort of like pathway to, to proper understanding. He goes on this journey until he finally comes to the conclusion, which is the conclusion we're going to look for this morning. This morning, we're going to answer the question, why do bad things, or rather, why do good things happen to bad people? Um, and to do so, we're going to follow Asaph's journey. So turn with me to Psalm 73. Um, why do the wicked prosper? Um, so the first thing we'll see in the first 12 verses is we're going to see what I call Asaph's perceived problem. Uh, in this first section of verses, we're going to see him describe exactly what's going on and describe what he perceives on his own. Uh, but first, notice the first two verses of this psalm. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my steps came close to stumbling. My steps almost slipped. So first of all, recognize this sort of introduction. Before he gets into the problem, recognize that, he's rec that already God is good to those people uh, who are pure in heart. So God is good, no matter what else. Remember this fact. And then recognize God is good. It is me, it is Asaph, who almost slipped. So even from the beginning, recognize that Asaph knows all that he's about to say isn't true. What we're about to discuss here, that's Asaph's thinking. And that so often is our thinking. Our thinking that this world is unfair. So what, what is Asaph's thinking? Well, let's read. Um, Verses 3 through 5. Uh, my steps almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant, as I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they felt no pains in their death, and their bodies were fat. They are not troubled like other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Well, what does Asaph see? He looks around and he sees wickedness. He sees arrogance. He sees the prosperous, the prosperity of those who are wicked. Um, they face no pain. They have whatever they want in this life. They don't go without. They get whatever they want, and they never have any hurt, never have any pain. There's no problems that they have in this world. That's what Asaph's seeing. Not only do they, not, do they have everything they need, they do whatever they want. As we keep reading, uh, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garments of violence cover them. Their eyes bulge with fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. So not only do they have whatever they want, and they face no problems, they do whatever they want. Violence and pride guide their every decision. So if they can do whatever they want, are they doing good things? No. No, they're doing whatever their prideful mind wants and whatever violent act they see fit. So they're taking advantage even more. They're gaining more wealth. They're hurting more people. Uh, so they have whatever they want. They do whatever they want. 
and they don't recognize God. Uh, verses 9 and 10. They have set their mouth against the heavens, their tongues parade through the earth. Therefore, his people return to this place. The waters of abundance are drunk by them. They speak against heaven. Uh, so maybe they consider God, but they don't trust God. They don't think God's real. They speak against God and do whatever they want. These, this is the wickedness of the world. And this is uh, the wicked as Asaph sees them. Because intellectually, we understand the wicked, they still have problems, right? We understand all these politicians, all these corporate executives. Like, sure, they do have money. They do have comforts, but they still have problems. I mean, sometimes they even get arrested for the bad things that they do. Occasionally, they face punishment as they should. Sometimes they don't, but they do. And even those that don't face any punishment, they still have their problems. They don't go around life just freely with no guilt. They don't have an easy life as Asaph is describing. And we know that, right? So then why is it that we follow the same line of thinking? How, why is it that so often we think just the same way Asaph is? That, you know, the wicked can do whatever they want and they get away with all of it and they're blessed for it. Um, verses 11 and 12 really sum up this. They say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, they are wicked. They are always at ease. They have increased in wealth. They don't think God can see what they're doing. And so they continue to do wicked, and their wealth increases. Um, and remember, this is, this is Asaph's thinking, right? This isn't God speaking. This isn't biblical truth. This is Asaph's uh, perceived problem. This is what he's thinking. It's not the truth. Uh, remember verses 1 and 2. God is good to his people, but I almost slipped. Asaph is almost slipping when he thinks through this. Um, so as we continue, we're going to see Asaph fall into even further pity. This is what I call Asaph's pity party, verses 13 through 17. Um, this is where Asaph really starts to feel sorry for himself. Uh, he starts to think, why should I be good at all if all it brings me is suffering? So let's read 13 and 14. Surely in vain... I have kept my heart pure, and I have washed my hands in innocence. For I have been stricken all day long and chastised every morning. So this is Asaph's lowest low. He continues his line of thinking. He continues to see the wickedness of the world and see how they prosper. And then he thinks about himself, and he thinks, well, I've been, I'm, I'm good. I'm a good person. And I suffer for it? How fair is that? I should just stop being good. I should stop being good, and I should be wicked like them, because then I would prosper and I wouldn't suffer anymore. That is the, the pinnacle of Asaph's terrible thinking. That's the pinnacle of Asaph's pervasive logic. That's the worst. That's the last thing we want to do. Um, and Asaph recognizes this. When we continue in verse 15, If I had said, I will speak, speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed this generation of your children. So he recognizes this is toxic thinking. Not only is it not good for me, if I were to teach other people this, it would destroy a generation of people. Uh, can you imagine if you taught your kids, oh, be wicked. If you're wicked, you get everything you want. And if you're good, that's, that's a bad thing. You're just going to suffer for good. That would destroy a generation. Um, and it's clearly being taught here. So I think it's worth at least considering at this point, are we guilty of that? Is our terrible thinking about the ways of the world causing us to slip into further a downward spiral? Because I think that's what would happen. If we were to pursue this line of thinking, if you were to truly consider in your, in your heart and in your mind, okay, the wicked always get what they want and the good just suffer, I think that's a poison. That's going to rot your heart to the point where, you know what you're going to do? You're going to do wicked. You're going to do the bad things of this world. You're going to convince yourself it's true. Not only that, you're going to convince your children that it's true. What example are you setting for them? This line of reasoning is toxic, and it should not be in the church. And Asaph finally recognizes that. Verses 16 and 17. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. That's the turning point. And that's where we see Asaph finally turns to God. Um, verse 16, he's perceiving his own thoughts still. When I tried to understand on my own, it was troublesome in my sight 
But when I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. And that leads us to the last section. This is Asaph's proper perspective. He comes to God and he recognizes God is the solution. And so that's what we need to recognize as well. When we're in this downward spiral of negative thinking, thinking this world is just hurting us, that they get away with everything, we need to get out of our own heads and look to God, just as the same. I came into the sanctuary of God. He turns to God for his solution. So that's what we're going to finish out with. What is Asaph's proper perspective? What does God tell us to do when we perceive the wickedness of this world? When we look around and we see all of this uh, persecution, when we see that we suffer, when we say they don't get punished, what should we be thinking? Well, first of all, when this world is not fair, remember, God never allows the wicked to truly prosper. That's what we see in verses uh, 18 through 20. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. Surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction. They are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their forms. God punishes the wicked. The wicked aren't going to get away with it. That's just the truth. Um, first of all, remember, God despises the wicked. Despite whatever you see, whatever you perceive, God is not okay with it. God's not okay with the wicked. God's not okay with their wicked deeds. And secondly, there's nothing God will punish their deeds. You know, uh, we read in uh, verses 8 through 11, we see their attitude. They think, oh, God's nothing. God's not going to punish me. But that's just not the truth. They will be punished at some point. Um, and really, there's nothing they can do to escape that punishment re aside from repenting, changing their life, and turning to God. That's the only thing they can do to escape this judgment. Um, I think of it as like almost a Shakespearean tragedy of some kind. You know? It goes well for the longest part, and it always ends in tragedy. It always ends badly for those who are wicked in this world. You can only prosper for so long. Uh, now, part of that is understanding. Maybe... They never suffer in this world. Maybe the prosperous wicked live their whole lives and they get whatever they want and they never suffer and then they die. Well, that's the point that we need to remember. When they die, that's when judgment will happen, if not sooner. So then, when we are suffering because of these wicked people, what should we think? What should we remember? When we suffer, when this world is not fair, remember, God will punish the wicked. Uh, we know that God will deal with those who persecute us. We know that God will deal with those who are wicked, who cause us grief. And we know that if we are right with God, God will receive us instead. When the wicked cause us to suffer, remember, God is waiting. Second, we recognize that when this world is not fair, remember that in eternity, God makes all things fair. That's kind of similar to the same point, but let's, let's read our passage and then make our application. Um, well, first of all, let's look at uh, verses 21 through 24, which really recaps what we've already talked about. When my heart was embittered, when I was pierced within, I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand, and with your counsel, you guide me, and afterwards, you receive me to glory. So first of all, we see that when Asaph was thinking on his own, when he tried to figure all this out on his own with his own understanding— it hurt him. He was senseless. He was pierced. He was embittered. He was ignorant. It's only when he turns to God that he finally recognizes that God was with him this whole time. God has taken hold of my right hand. With his counsel, God guides me, and God receives me to glory. And that's the first thing we need to understand. We can try to figure things out on our own, but it's not going to lead us down a good path. When we allow God to guide us, when we continue to pursue our being good instead of being wicked— God leads us. And where does God lead us? God receives us into glory. In eternity, God makes all things fair. We might suffer in this life. We might pay extra. We might get taken advantage of. We might not be given all the same advantages of the wicked. But when this life is over, we have the greatest advantage. The opposite is true as well. Let's continue reading verses uh, 25 through the end. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart might fail, 
but God is my strength in my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all of those who are unfaithful for you, to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made God, made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of your works. So the wicked, they are still going to be punished as well. Um, in my head, I think the easiest way for me to understand is that once we reach eternity, everything becomes binary. There's only two possible ways eternity goes. Here on earth, there's any slew of uh, prosperous and good and bad and evil. The wicked might suffer for their deeds. They might prosper for their deeds. The good, we, we might prosper, but we might suffer. Anything could happen here. But once we reach heaven, once we reach eternity, the only thing that matters is will God receive us? Will he, we be received into glory or will we perish? Um, and that's honestly for us, I think, a great encouragement. When we suffer, when the wicked out there cause us pain, well, we look ahead to eternity. In eternity, God makes all things fair. Um, so when we suffer because of the prosperous wicked of this world, it shouldn't worry us because we know we have something better. We know God will deal with those who persecute, and we know if we are right with God, God receives us into glory. All things are made fair when we look to eternity. That's the truth. And finally, when this world is not fair, we need to understand that it's our heart problem. Um, that's been the subtext throughout this whole psalm. If you turn back to the beginning, we'll just walk through these, but notice how many times it mentions the heart. In verse 1, God is good to those who are pure in heart. Uh, in verse 7, the wicked, the imaginations of the wicked's heart run riot, and they do whatever they want. Um, verse 13, surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. That's Asaph talking about himself. Uh, verse 21, when my heart was embittered and pierced within, I was senseless and ignorant. But verse 26 really brings us to this point. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Um, I think it's important to note, a lot of the times in the Bible, when we read this word heart, it's closer to what we would think of as mind or thought. It's, it's really the way we think. When it says the ways of our heart, it's the way that we think through things. So how do we understand the wicked? That's, that's what this is getting at. Well, we see clearly from Asaph, when I try to understand the wickedness of this world on my own, it doesn't go well. I think that the wicked always prosper and the good always suffer and the wicked get whatever they want and it causes this downward spiral that causes me even more pain. It troubles me. It makes me pierced within. It makes me senseless and ignorant. It makes me like a beast before God. It is when I turn to God and when I rely on God's understanding for these things. That's when I finally find relief. That's when I finally come to the understanding. The wicked will suffer. The wicked aren't going to get away with it. In eternity, God makes all things fair. And in this life, I need to turn my heart and focus on God, not myself. That's the difference. Um, so when we rely on our own thinking, we also come close to slipping. That's what the psalm is about, right? Back in verse 2, Asaph recognizes this. He recognizes, I almost slipped. I almost messed up. I almost came to this line of thinking. And I almost even caused the children uh, to be mistied, to be hurt. Well, what about us? Are we going to slip? Are we going to allow this to rot our thinking? Are we going to let this discourage us? Or are we going to turn our thoughts and turn our hearts to God? That's what we're called to do. When this world isn't fair, remember, allow God to strengthen your heart. And this world isn't fair. As we conclude this morning, this world is not fair. There are wicked people out there who will take advantage of each and every one of us. There's ways in which we, as Christians, we're going to be at a disadvantage in this world. Um, it, but if we are committed to doing good, we're going to continue to do good, to do good, no matter what it matters to us. Even if we have to suffer for our good, we continue to do good. Um, but don't let this unfairness of this world get you down. Recognize that if you rely on your own understanding, it's going to get you down. You're going to continue down this negative spiral. Instead, when this world is not fair to you, remember God. Remember, God makes all things fair in eternity. 
God will set your heart straight and God will not allow the wicked to go unpunished. So as we close this morning, I'd really like to call, offer a bit of an invitation, but really more an encouragement. Um, all of us get discouraged. Discouragement is true and it's rife. We see the ways of the world and it hurts us. But that's not supposed to be the case. And we have a system here, even within the church, to encourage one another, to lift one another up, and to remind each other, remember God, remember truth, remember eternity. So at this time, maybe you are suffering. Maybe you have hurt in your life. Well, this is an opportunity to come forward and get help, to be strengthened by the church. Maybe you've been living a life where you're with the wicked. Maybe now's the time to change your life, to repent before it's too late. Got to remember God will punish the wicked. If you're one of the wicked, you don't want to be. You have this opportunity to repent and to come forward. Um, maybe you want to continue and re-edify yourself and recommit yourself to doing good. Well, now's that opportunity to do that as well. We have a great opportunity now as we come forward and as we stand and we sing to find that salvation. So I encourage all of you, if you have need, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.